So I want to just, first of all, just appreciate all of you. This is really amazing. And the rare opportunity we have is to come together. And so it is so rare to come together to find the ground. You know, I feel so, so much gratitude for this practice of paying attention. So much gratitude for actually learning how to, you know, I often think of Shakyamuni Buddha, you know, some of you have heard of him, old guy. So this person that lived 25, 2,600 years ago, maybe, you know, from the Zen tradition, it doesn't really matter whether the person was actually real, but that for sure something very interesting happened 2,600 years ago. Nothing was written down for about 500 years. Imagine playing telephone. So what we think the Buddha said or did was by telephone, like someone telling someone something. Imagine that going around for 500 years. So something we have still. And to me, the part of his story and his teaching that was so powerful and remains so powerful and enlivening to me is, you know, he practiced a lot of different things, many different teachers, tried a little of this, a little of that. You know, these days he could be on headspace for a while, 10% happier for a while. Or try a little vipassana, a little insight, as we do. And at a certain point, he felt that he was still not addressing this real fundamental point, which was his fear. This kind of, these days we call it anxiety, kind of tone it down. And he realized that he just kept moving. And there was this habit of moving, moving when he got uncomfortable. He would try something different. Try something different. And I so relate to that. So I feel so grateful for that part of the story. But how human that is. Right? To like feel, ugh. This is uncomfortable. I don't like these people. I want a different group, a group, different path. And he allowed himself to actually hear that I need to stop doing that. Some part of him understood they had to stop. So famously, he sat under this tree, which we now call the Bodhi tree, which is really a fig tree. I love that it was a fig tree. I was sat under a very aromatic fig tree. It's pretty wonderful. So under some shelter, he sat. And, you know, as it is an Indian tradition, you know, it was like all of these like demons came to him. As they do, right? Strange things coming. So all his fears and all his like the seduction of you know all the things that keep us distracted. I always think to think of him as like this person who like, was just on his phone scrolling, scrolling. He was like doom scrolling before that. 
and how it's so contemporary. to really look at, to say, I'm not gonna move away from just here. I'm just gonna stay here. And to me, it's so amazing to do this like well, in a talk, because you can actually look at and say, like, I'm gonna stay here with you, Ole. <laughs> stay here with you, Deb. With you, Deborah Greg, Gregory. You know, it's really an amazing opportunity to, to me. It's like that, you know, we have this habit that I often think about where you're talking to someone and then they look away because I have to think. Ever do that? Like you're talking to someone and then they're like, mm. I always think like what the Buddha was doing is like, I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna stay straight on. I'm gonna stay connected. That doc, Holly and David's doc. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> so really learning how to really pay attention and to not move away, to not close your eyes, to not look away from what makes us most uncomfortable. And it seems that we have plenty of things that make us uncomfortable. Many people say these days, like now more than ever. Well, I don't know if that's really true. There's suddenly music. Because, you know, the Buddha also experienced political upheaval. His, his community, his own clan were wiped out. They had pandemics. So in some ways, there was nothing new. He lived in a culture where women were, you know, not given the same rights as men. He lived in our world, like a very contemporary, very contemporary. And the freedom comes, which to me is the most amazing thing. Like many people, we come to this practice and, you know, and a lot of science will tell you, well, it'll lower your blood pressure, which, you know, good thing. <laughs> reduce your stress, reduce your anxiety, reduce your pain levels. It's all, you know, to me, that's all gravy. But what he was really teaching about, which I find so enlivening, is that he was teaching about how to be free and how to work with your distraction. How I can do that here in New York City. how you can do that right where you are, in the conditions where you are. It's so extraordinary. So jump ahead, you know, about a little less than 2000 years. There was this guy named Dogen who was the founder of our school in Japan. Grew up, didn't know his father. His mother died when he was five. He'd have good reasons to, you know, throw in the towel. Like it didn't work out so well for him as a young little boy. But there was something that drew him and I think that maybe that has drawn all of us to say, oh, maybe there's another way. There's 
he fell as a young kid. That there was something important. beyond our habitual thing. And to me, it's such a wonderful thing. Like, what is that for you? Like, what actually, what was it that turned you? Like, what brought you here tonight? And to actually say like, wow, I value this way of finding a new way of being so much so that I will dedicate some time. So Dogen, you know, as a young kid, you know, he joined a monastery and his story in many ways mirrors the story of the Buddha where he, you know, tried a little esoteric kind of Vajrayana tradition, he tried a little of this tradition, a little of that tradition. Very much the same. But he had this burning question of like that. He heard this teaching where he said, you know, if we're already perfect and complete and lacking nothing, imagine that. What is it that we have to practice if we're already complete? And he felt that none of those teachers at all these different places, he went to a yoga studio and to like, <laughs> Again, it's such a contemporary, contemporary story. Even though he died about 775 years ago. But he felt that "Mm, there's something really important here that no one seems to answer. How do I become more alive? And so he studied with lots of people all over Japan. And then at a certain point, he found with his, had a friend named Nyozen, and they said, I'm going to go to China and check out what's going on over there. It's kind of like in the 60s, everyone was going to India or Cambodia or Sri Lanka. Right? See where the juice is. And when he went there, they were quarantined. Sounds familiar. They had a quarantine for two weeks. And during that time, you know, the people, the ships coming from Japan to China were carrying goods and things for other people to use. And so and some people would come to the port, even though they were quarantined, that, that they would kind of exchange and buy stuff. And, and this, what was described as very elderly man who was in his 60s, <laughs> came, to, <laughs> came to see him because he was there actually carrying all these shiitake mushrooms. You know, now we like go to Whole Foods or something. You know, here they you know, have to go to a ship where they're coming in. And so this old guy comes, you know, as the story goes, and he's a cook. And this cook, which is in a Zen monastery, is kind of like the most revered position because it's thought to be the one that, because you have to always be thinking of others. And it was thought to be like, you have to be a very special kind a person to keep others in mind. And so this, they began talking on the ship. And Dogen said to him, he was a young person at that time, and said, you know, well, there must be younger people. Where's your monastery? He's like, oh, it's about 20 miles from here. So I walked 20 miles for these mushrooms because Tomorrow is a kind of a special day at our monastery. And so I thought having a little something special in the soup would be nice. Like how beautiful is that? You know, how rarely do we do that? Like, oh, I'm gonna really make a huge effort so that others can actually appreciate (laughs) something 
sweet and surprising, like mushrooms from another country. And, uh, and Dogen was just so confused. He said, well, why would you do that? Well, there must be other people. You're so old being 60 years old. That's crazy. Yeah. And the man just turned to him and said, you know, if I don't do it, who will do it? I am the tenzo. I am the cook. It is my role. And there's something so amazing to me about that. And this had such a deep impression on Dogen. That it is up to each of us to live our life. That nobody else can do it for you. I know for many years, you know, I did started practicing a while ago. And, you know, for many years, I was so sure that I was kind of a victim. Because actually, I had some things happen to me in my life that I felt like I had good reasons to stay in that state. Things happened to me that were terrible, actually. physical violence, verbal violence, sexual violence. When I was a kid, young person, and as we know, it's one in four women, and one in five men experience these things. A lot. And so, I found that actually I was still bringing this kind of very guarded attitude to my practice, which made sense. It really made sense. You know, I have a lot of tenderness for that part of me. And so how do we appreciate that and also realize like it's still up to me because I still found I was still like, mm, if only that didn't happen only the conditions were different. Ever do that? Wish that your life had, you know, gone a different way. Different experiences happened or didn't happen. And what's amazing is that, like, it's still up to you. And I realized that. You know, I remember actually at a retreat, <laughs> I don't know, a while ago. And sitting there and I was, you know, Zen, we were really into like robes and form and all of this stuff. But it's really not about that, but they're just all these ways to like pay attention to actually. A lot of bowing and these different things, but it's really about how do you get out of your own way and just, be part of the whole, which was very healing for me. And so learning how to pay attention in a very different way. I found myself, I remember sitting at this retreat and thinking, wow, like I was sitting in full lotus and I, I, look, I felt like I was like, even thinking to myself, I'm like, I look so fierce. <laughs> <laughs> I was so in my head. <laughs> and and I just something hit me. I was sitting there gazing down at a 45 degree angle. And I realized that I was so caught up in myself. I was already a monk. <laughs> I already made these vows to serve and yet still was so dense maybe some of you are dense like me that we just don't you kind of intellectually get it but don't really get it right or have that experience where you intellectually understand but you're still doing the same thing <laughs> it's 
it's such a nightmare. <laughs> and yet workable. And so what happened, I remember gazing down 45 degree angle and just seeing the light move across the wooden floor. And there's something just so, just suddenly I saw the light actually. It reminded me of actually this amazing quote from William Blake who said, Moses didn't see a burning bush, he just saw the bush. He just really saw it. And it felt like that. It just felt like the light was on the floor, but I just felt like suddenly things felt extraordinary. And this is after, I don't know, 10 years of what I was calling some serious practice. And it, to me, it's also like deeply respecting how long it takes, whatever that is for us. Some of us, it's decades. Who cares? It's never too late. But it was a, this awareness of like, oh my goodness, I was, so, I just saw with it, gazing down there that I saw that I was so caught up in myself. And it reminded me of Dogen on that boat, like, why do you have to do that? Like, I just realized that I was not practicing with everybody, even though I was with everybody. And it was like this amazing moment where I realized, ah, it's almost like this scrim. I don't know if you know, like in the theater, sometimes they put down this very thin, remember when I used to go to the theater? And they, they put this like very thin screen down and so you can kind of see, but not see. So it's almost like that lifted and suddenly I was like, oh my goodness. My goodness, how I have been kind of hiding and still acting as if I was still afraid and locking myself in the bathroom, like as a kid in a subtle way, like it wouldn't have looked that way, but it was that way. I wasn't actually in the time of my life. And so to me, it's so beautiful. It's like this amazing opportunity, like we we're doing that practice of zazen and learning how just to ground ourselves. Suddenly that instruction felt so powerful and it still feels like that tonight. To actually ground myself, to actually feel my sit bones, to actually put my hips forward, to actually open my shoulders, to actually be with each of you is the most extraordinary thing. so much I want to share with you, so, but I will share. Uh, but Dogen gave a teaching about these three minds, he called it San Shin, three minds. <laughs> and the three minds are, the first one is which in many ways is the most important, which is Daishin which is great mind. That this is what we need to cultivate. How do you cultivate great mind is actually to pivot, like in that moment of seeing the light, it's like that we just pivot into realizing that this life is not about me. It's about how I serve, how I participate. Great mind is that integration where it's not like you don't exist anymore. It's just like you exist with the world. How amazing is that? How rare is that?
And the second is Roshi, which is means sometimes translated as a grandmotherly mind. And you know, maybe some of you had a nice grandma, some of you didn't have a nice grandma. <laughs> It's not about the personal grammar. It's more like that feeling of that kind of archetypal energy of like the kind and loving grandmother. And Dogen actually had this student who everyone thought would be the, the next. And he said, no, he's not going to be the next teacher because he doesn't have enough grandmotherly mind. So he meant this wise and loving mind. So they kind of like a good grandma knows like what your deal is. She sees you. She's like, mm, I see you, I see you. And so how do we develop that in ourself where we can see clearly and lovingly? And the third is Kishan, our joyful mind. So to me, these are like wonderful antidotes for our isolation. They're wonderful antidotes for how we bury ourselves. Maybe we don't still need to. And joyful mind is kind of surprising because it's the joy that you can feel everything, even what feels feels unbearable. You're joyful because you can actually have the experience. It's like the, we're talking about that river. It's like that you can actually sit on the bank of the river and watch it all to feel your outrage, to feel your rage, to feel your sorrow to feel your great joy, your great determination, sadness, whatever it is, a grief, a celebration, joyful mind. So I wanted to offer those to you as perhaps good medicine for you to explore you know, what those three minds could actually support you as they support me. And I'm so grateful, grateful to be there. Thank you. So I would love mostly just to have a conversation and to connect with you. And so would love your thoughts for Elaine, who's very mysterious. You look like a circle with a, and an opal. If I, thank you, Koshan, if I turn on the visual, it freezes the computer, so. Uh, yeah, I know. So it, it helps when that's not on. Thank you so much. Um, I have two different questions, if I may. Well, no, one is actually a, a comment. And I haven't read all that much about Buddhism or Zen Buddhism, but this is actually the first time, and maybe I just heard it, <laughs> seeing the bush, the first time uh, about Buddha and fear. I mean, I know suffering and I know the story is about, you know, seeing somebody sick in, in old age and death and suffering and, and seeing other people suffer. I don't believe I have ever heard anybody or mm -hmm. read anything about this Buddha trying to get rid of this basic fear, mm -hmm. which is really powerful and interesting and if i may um the other thing when when you were giving instruction mm -hmm. for doing for doing the counting mm -hmm. 
and and that hara is that how you say it like you're focusing on this point yeah. and yeah. you're kind of focusing on the breath you're kind of focusing on the number that you're counting and i thought whoa three more thoughts here and it is in a way somehow more covering up than what i think i should be doing because I'm paying attention to the to which number comes next and like in the breath and then this spot on my body. And I thought, hmm, so could you say some more about that? <laughs> it seems like more thoughts. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great. And thank you. And so I would just say that I just, we had practice with our community tonight and someone came in to see me and, you know, and, and Zen, we have a tradition where we meet face to face a lot. <laughs> they said, guess what? You know, like I got to 12. <laughs> I said, yeah, but you weren't there. You know, you were just like in an idea. And he's like, oh, ooh. <laughs> so it's not about the numbers, really. It's just about. <laughs> the tender vigor of like, oop, I went away, I went away, I went away. It's like, you can even notice that again, as like we were talking about earlier about the body language. It's just like when we kind of look away, look away, look away in our habit of looking away. And so how do we have that tender vigor? I feel like just stay with one, you know, like, cause in many ways for like, I don't know, a couple of years, like that can be very honest. <laughs> it's not about it. It's just interesting how we like try to make things into achievement. <laughs> I got a high number, man. I'm cool. You know, like it's not really about that at all. You can just be doing this practice beautifully. And like one, where's my sandwich? One. I forgot that's the name of one. <laughs> Doesn't matter. And to me, what really does matter is your attitude. Because many people, we can use that as a weapon and kind of weaponize. You know, like, oh, see, I'm bad at that. And like, I can't even get to two or whatever that is. And so like, there's no joy, actually. It's like, we're just, you know, doing our same old thing of like hitting ourselves over the head with a club for like being a bad meditator. I think we should start a club for bad meditators. Like I'd join. <laughs> Cause it's not the point being a good meditator. Like I tried to actually for those first 10 years, try to be a good meditator. And I was mostly an ass, you know, like I was like, <laughs> I was out till lunch, you know, I was just in my head trying to be a busy, really busy, trying to be a good meditator. <laughs> but I don't know if that is helpful at all, but so it comes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tom, look at you, Tom, you look very intense. <laughs> You look I huge. Not. <laughs> I hope not. There, is that better? No, it's all very exciting. It's all good. So being that you're from the Zen discipline, I was curious what your thoughts were on koans. Did you, uh, did you do them? Did you find them helpful? Uh, that type of thing. Hmm. Yeah, so I practice in a tradition from the, my Zumi Roshi line. So we're in some Zen schools, they do koans, sometimes they don't, but our tradition we do. And I did uh, work on koans for 18 years, you know, first gave it a little whirl. And often they're thought of as riddles and something strange and something, whatever that is. And to me, what's so exciting is that they're actually about how can you be spontaneous? Where do you get caught up in your thoughts? So I would guess it depends on the teacher you're working with, but I was always very interested and in taught about how does it make you feel more alive and connected and loving. 
and what holds you back and what's your hesitation. So it depend, I guess it would depend on what, uh, I guess the teacher would, it would always matter as what the, who the teacher is, who you're working with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Bob and Doris, what's going on over there in the backyard there? Aloha. Um, Aloha. So we are really loving this tonight. It, it's both our first time ever meditating with our eyes a little open. <laughs> and um, it was Mother. really hard. It was hard. <laughs> I kept wanting to close my eyes and I was like, nope, stick with it, you know. And it was really a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're happy that we tuned in. This is our favorite day of the week. We get to be with Bell, the meditators, and mm -hmm. uh, with Rick and with the wonderful guest speakers when he's gone. And mm -hmm. we're going to look you up after this because we really love you. Like uh, when you said you were horrible at it, like right in the beginning, it took away all the pressure of us not having to do it right. So it was just mm -hmm. so wonderful. Yep. And then um, I, I have some family stuff going on where, um, you know, my grown children got married. And so now I have grown daughter-in-laws. And so there's a little turmoil in the family. And all the messages I've been getting from the universe is to cut loose and live my life. And they're in Minnesota. And I live in Hawaii now for the last eight years. And that might be a little bit of the resentment. <laughs> I don't know. But um you just reaffirmed what I've been hearing from the universe is to live my best life right now, you know, mm -hmm. and don't, um, don't feel like the victim mm -hmm. move on. And, you know, like Rick always says, keep your side of the street clean and keep the door mm -hmm. open, you know, but um, right. don't sit and ruminate about it in the middle of the night. So I just want to thank you so much for really lifting me up today. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm beautiful. I've been enjoying watching you too out oh. there in Hawaii. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, Bob and Doris. Look at Julia's visiting from maybe another planet. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Are you on the moon? I <laughs> I I I'm I'm in Los Angeles, honestly. Um, I really appreciate how permissive your approach has been. And I have a question because I would be that perfectionist trying to count to 12. But instead, sometimes when I'm overwhelmed, I get kind of narcoleptic. And I don't know if you could speak a little bit to that that happened today. Mm. Yeah, one of my students is um, in his residency in medical school. And so he gets, you know, they have like these insane shifts, <laughs> you know, 14 hours, 20 hours, you know. And he gets tired, believe it or not. And so he was just came in to meet with me tonight and he's like, I'm so narcoleptic. <laughs> And just like kind of like doing this. <laughs> and, you know, to me, it's actually how do you find when you start to feel that it's such an interesting feeling. And so how do you work with it? How do you work with your tiredness? And how do you find the place in you that's not tired? You know, and to me, it's a very interesting space. The space right before you kind of fall asleep is like, how do you just make contact there and say like, oh, what else is here? What else is here? And if you fall asleep, it's not such a big deal. Just wake up and begin again. It's like counting actually. It's the same deal. You know, fall asleep and come back fall asleep and come back. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for visiting us, Julian, from the moon. 
Uh, Elena Levine or Levine? It's Levine, uh, East Coast. My father in the army said it's Levine. It rhymes with latrine. It's not Levine as in Kishmir and Tachasarain. <laughs> anyway, so thank you for the joy. Um, I, I just first want to say I saw and heard you at the JCC when your book came out, Wholehearted, which I highly oh, yeah. recommend. I haven't seen you plugging it here, but someone should. It's, it's a wonderful book, which I, which, which I wish I could remember better now. But what I wanted to ask was something you said tonight that caught me most, or one of the things about the three minds, the third mind, the joy mind, the joyful mind. Um, it was a really novel concept to throw in watching everything that goes by in the river because I'm suffering with chronic pain for 19 plus years and only got diagnosed six months ago with something that often is missed. And I'm a doctor, so go figure. But anyway, um, it's severe and it's unrelenting most of the time. And it's a really nice way of flipping it. That It's amazing I can feel anything. It's, I guess it means I'm alive. Yet, it's extremely challenging. So uh, you know, as you must might imagine in the work you do and so any tips you got for that? Yeah, sometimes it's shitty, you know? And to not pretend that it's not. And, you know, it's like trying to pretend like a toxic dump is like a pretty place. It's like, it's not, you know, it's just, it's just what it is. And just, but, it, you know, how do you not make a cling to the story about it? Right. Even if it's really, really hard. I often find, you know, I have not had chronic pain for 18 years, so I do not know what it's like. So I don't want to Thank, Thank you for saying for, that. You know, and it's, I do uh, work with a lot of people who do have pain. And to me, it's like, how do you honor it? and also get curious about it. And how is that, you know, a wonderful teacher, John kovitz was talking about like, how do you pay attention to like the, what is it right now? Is it, is it a 10 right now? Or is it an eight? You know, I remember once like, you know, a friend of mine saying, who also lived with chronic pain, like, oh, it's a nine right now, I'm so grateful. <laughs> Could be 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like where most of the time it was at such a pitch, like it was almost unbearable. Or we actually have a few community members who have Crohn's disease. And so like that is just rough, you know, with severe pain, you know, agony at points. And you know how they really have learned to like pay attention to even those like little micro and appreciating the micro differences. You know, it's an easy thing to say too. Yeah. And yet what I've seen working with people is that it makes an enormous difference. It's like, but it's really learning how to like, you know, riding a you know, mechanical bull or a real bull. It's like, it's challenging. Yeah to stay on there so to stay with the practice is super challenging and it takes time to learn how to ride it and yet we can and we need support and we need support so making sure you have some community around you that where people who who actually who won't turn away well or try Please, to that's say, oh, you'll feel better. Or like, oh, no, 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 no. That's been better in COVID than it was in 18 years before because now it's on Zoom and I can have these groups that I couldn't attend. So amazing. I have found some people who really get it Beautiful. in these groups. But, but that's, that's a good point, the, uh, the micro-noticing. 
because those like I'll never forget my friend who's like I'm just so pleased he's like I'm at a nine. Thank you. Good to see you, Elena. You too. Judith with a great flower. Hello. You're floating yeah, in the just, flower. Yes. It's magical. Anyway, I, I guess I'd just like to share related to your the last question. I've lived with a lot of chronic pain. And just one thing that I've found helpful is remembering that pain is a sign of vitality. Mm, uh, that's just, I just throw that out. That's been very helpful for me. Right, that you're still alive. I'm still alive, yeah. And I, I guess I... I was interested in your comments about growing up with various kinds of abuse or stuff like that. And, and I guess I have that, those kinds of issues within my background. And mm -hmm. I guess one of the things that I've found is, is to, that's been really helpful is to be present with it and to recognize the gifts that have come out of that experience in my life that I never would have probably had if I didn't go through that. And um, I, it just, I don't know. I guess, I guess I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah. That, that's because uh, I, I guess I, I, I struggle. I'm actually a deacon in the Episcopal church and I've dealt with issues like clergy sexual misconduct. And, and of course that's a subject that most people, you know, oh, we, we don't like talking about that. <laughs> no one likes talking about it. That's, well, why, I mean, I, I, that's why I always I talk may, about it. I may start say something about it and then and then they say, oh, well, it's so important that you brought that up and then the conversation ends there, you know. <laughs> but it's like, I, I, I think we, we're missing... I guess in so many ways that we deal with things uh, um, the opportunity for grace by trying to 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 not talk about these things that 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 that, that there is a way way to really healing and 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 um, redemption I guess is a word that I in my tradition that we would use but to new life to new vitality to uh, to come out of that beautiful. Anyway, thank you did. not anyway. Thank you. I think I have time for one more. Rachel. Rachel in the forest. Hi. Yes, in the forest. Not in the forest fire yet, but in the forest. Um, yeah, there's one not too far from here. Uh, yeah, you know, I really liked your comments just kind of about the mind. And I have a question, but I don't even know uh, what I'm saying. But, you know, sometimes when I talk to people, I just feel like there's quite a deep connection. And they can be like strangers. And um, I'm wondering if you have any comments about what that is. And I don't know. That's my, that's my question. What is that when you feel so deeply connected but sometimes a complete stranger. Oh, I don't actually believe in strangers. They're just people oh. I haven't met yet. Okay, well, perhaps that's it. <laughs> <laughs> like for me, that's part of, you know, those three minds. It's like, <laughs> like, oh, I just haven't met you yet. That's why I'm like, hey, look at you, Deb. You know, like, you know, just like looking at everybody, like stranger, like who's the stranger? Well, uh, I can be strange for sure, but like, <laughs> but you know, I think that stranger just is a, I would love to know the etymology of that, but you know, but I think that it's just a way of separating. It's just people we haven't met yet. You know, like I have this, you know, I love one of my favorite things of, 
to do is walk, you know, we're on this very busy thoroughfare and, and it's, I love it. Cause you know, when you walk down the street on 23rd street, there's ambulances and sirens and homeless people. Like we're all, everybody's there. And, you know, if you walk down the street, you can actually see the other people who are actually walking down the street and you recognize each other. You're like, Hey, look, look, look at you. You're here too. <laughs> it's like so exciting. And you actually <laughs> recognize each other. Right. I mean, where most of the people are just like, my little zombie. Uh-huh. But, so. a, a lot of people think they know me, but you know, maybe they do. And they spend a lot of time trying to can make the dot. They trying to tell me that they do know me, but they don't. I don't know what maybe that they do, Rachel. <laughs> maybe they just know that you seem open and warm. Oh, something's going on. I don't know what. I mean, literally, like, um. Well, I don't want to use the word stranger anymore. I got to think of a new word. <laughs> People you haven't met yet. Yeah, the people I don't know <laughs> yet. <Yeah. laughs> That's hilarious. Thanks. That's really good. I love that. I totally love that. Thank you. <laughs> so I believe we pause now. So I wanted to before just to leave you with a chant. Is that okay? So it's a chant that we chant uh, every evening at our temple. And it's a poem from Dogen, and so I just want to offer it to you. And thank you so much. It's been really joyful for me to be with you. So let's see your faces. Let me respectfully remind you Life and death are of supreme importance. Time swiftly passes by and opportunities are lost. On this night, the days of our life are decreased by one. Each of us must strive to awaken, awaken. Take heed, do not squander your life. Thank you all so much. May you be joyful, wise, loving, and attentive.